For 98 years, we have strived for and achieved excellence. From humble beginnings in 1921, we have worked together to develop a strong foundation built on patient care, education, and research, leading to excellent patient outcomes. But the environment is changing. Economics, societal expectations, workloads, and accountabilities. And we must continue to pursue excellence despite the changing environment. Our patients depend on this pursuit, and we depend on this pursuit. This is something we can do together. Our shared values of innovation, responsibility, and professionalism will hold us together on this journey. We must think and do differently while holding on to our shared values. We must innovate to overcome the challenges. We can and we are. Ensuring that we are successful in achieving excellence for many years to come. Improving lives together. This film, Odyssey, journeys through the Department of Surgery's stunning successes. But first, let's see where it all came from and on whose shoulders we are standing as we peer into the future. I think the most important thing about the Department of Surgery is that it's older than the Department of Medicine. So it started in 1922 and the Department of Medicine started in 1923. So it's always great to have a one-up on the internists, right? After the war is when the residency training program became a complete program. Um, up to that point in time, University of Alberta, you could do your first two years, but then you had to go somewhere else to finish it. So later on, we actually had a benefit of having people who, while they'd started their training here, they'd finished their residency in some of the best American and Canadian institutions you know, around the continent. So we had a very diverse group of well-trained uh, surgeons who had a superb uh, teaching ethos. In the early, back in the 50s, some of the leading research on dialysis and kidney transplant was uh, performed at the University of Alberta in the Surgical Medical Research Institute. So it was natural for that interest in transplant to grow as solid organ transplant became more readily available as immunosuppression was perfected. Bob McBeth took over the leadership of the department here and that's when the research you know, years were, were born and then they were supported even further by Dr. Williams when he became the chair. At the time, too, it was becoming clear that the standards of research were, like everything in life, going up, and the demands for a graduate degree were increasing. Now, the fact of the matter is, the University of Alberta was recognized for a long time as an outstanding university. So this was just another step in that path of making it, you know, a world-class, you know, research a surgery research program. You know, our first graduate in that surgeon scientist program to do a PhD was Dr. David Mercer. And his main paper out of his activities was a lead, lead article in the journal Science with accompanying editorials, which was, yeah, that was hitting the home run out of the ballpark for sure. Our performance is on the world stage. Always has been and hopefully always will be. The journey has been long. So, where have we arrived so far? The Department of Surgery is a national and international leader in education, research, and clinical programs. But it's more than that. It's a community. Dr. Gina Riot is the director of the Ray Rajat Surgical Medical Research Institute, which has been at the heart of her learning, teaching, and research since day one in her career, over three decades ago. What makes the SMRI unique is, is its role it plays in, in training our residents, in training our graduate students, in innovation in terms of surgical procedures. Um, I know that other universities 
in their program have uh, provide opportunities for the resident to do research, but they don't have facility uh, like the SMRI to explore more, more ways in, in training. And so whenever we did research in SMRI, it was translational to help the patient down the road. I mean, around the wall, I don't know how many scientists here, and they're all clinicians, <laughs> you know, so I mean, all of them are, their, the, you know, they're outstanding surgeons in their own right. And so I, I, don't, I couldn't even venture to think how many patients it has impact. Thousands, thousands. The Ray Rajat Surgical Medical Research Institute is just one component of the Department of Surgery's education programs. Similar in its commitment to excellence is the department's support for its learners through the Office of Surgical Education. We sat down with Ms. Valerie Masson, Dr. Bianca Saravana Bawan, and Dr. Mauricio Caldas Abreu to see how the Office of Surgical Education makes a huge university seem intimate and why Edmonton is the place to be. So for me, considering where I was going to do my surgical training, there were two really important things to consider. Um, number one, anybody wants to come out of a surgical training program knowing that they'll have the confidence and the ability to operate. And that's something that any staff that I've worked with, they really felt that that was really provided for them with the operative experience and the, the range of general surgery that they were exposed to, that they would come out being a capable and confident surgeon. And the other thing is, residency is hard, so you want to be in an environment where you have colleagues and um, friends that you can work together with and really make work an enjoyable atmosphere. Education is always evolving, so we need to evolve with it. Not everywhere has a Office of Surgical Education to look after all the surgical programs, so that's where I think we're really unique. Uh, at the University of Alberta in the Department of Surgery uh, because we're a very close collaborative team uh, that we can uh, troubleshoot together. The reason I wanted to get in enroll with the transplantation program at the University of Alberta was because uh, uh, part of it is recognized of the six in the world. Other, other reasons why I choose to come here is because they have the K-Clinic, which is a state-of-the-art facility, and as a trainee or even as a staff physician, to work there, like, you cannot get any better. So Edmonton is a wonderful city. It's a multicultural city. It has people from all over the world. People are, are extremely friendly. Everybody's helpful for anything you need, uh, not only at the university campus, but all across the city. It's a great atmosphere to, to work and to enjoy your life in. Another integral part of residency training is the CASES program. Our uh, program is uh, really passionate about surgical education. So what we do is we train uh, healthcare professionals ranging from medical students, surgery trainees, uh, nurse trainees, and physicians, surgeons, and nurses in practice. We have a lot of experience. We've been working on this type of training for many years. When they're training, it feels real, and I think that uh, that allows the resident to really experience what it's like in an OR. Medical students, uh, nurses, uh, and residents will be able to handle the equipment they use in the OR. They can get comfortable with the equipment. They can develop confidence with it. We try to evaluate everything that we do and we take that feedback uh, quite seriously. So we sort of see that we have established a curriculum for surgical education, but it's constantly evolving, uh, changing and improving. Now who said surgical education can't be fun? Dr. Jonathan White certainly didn't. When he isn't in the OR or researching surgical education, he finds himself creating educational content with a creative twist. Thumbs! <laughs> Wake up, man! This is no time for sleep! Sorry, Dr. Scalpel. I promise it won't happen again. Surgery 101 no. is a podcast. It's a website. It's an app. It's on a number of different platforms, but essentially it's a, an online learning tool to help medical students learn all about surgery. 
Well, originally we just thought we were making it for 125 medical students at the, at the U of A, because that's the size the class was back in 2008. And we made it for them and we did a little study and we moved on to other stuff. And then we started getting people from other countries emailing us to say, hey, I found this podcast myself. We didn't market it, we didn't put it out there, but I got an email from a guy in, in, in Brazil saying he liked this podcast and could we make a, another episode? Somebody in Romania said, hey, you've got an episode on appendicitis, but can you make one on pancreatitis? So it kind of got, got away from us a bit, and we, we sort of accidentally encountered this global audience of medical students. It's not a complicated thing, it's very much the basics. It's not surgery 501, it's surgery 101. Dr. White initially targeted undergraduates with his innovative educational style, working with Ms. Shannon Erickson, who administrates the undergraduate surgical education program. What we're trying to do for medical students is introduce them to the specialty, give them some of the tools that will help them decide whether or not to pursue a surgical career, and ultimately, where does surgery fit in patient care? A highlight of the Division of Anatomy, in addition to the cadaver program, is our undergraduate and extensive resident teaching. Dr. Christine Weber takes us through the Division of Anatomy's contribution to training. The Division of Anatomy is one of the very few cadaver-based full dissection programs in Canada. We provide a unique educational opportunity to over a thousand learners each year. The Anatomical Gifts program allows students to appreciate 3D relationships of anatomical structures to visualize pathology and understand normal variations that occur between people. These world-class education programs are creating the surgeons of tomorrow, improving lives. But in order to create tomorrow's surgeons, we need to focus on research today. Today's research is tomorrow's technology, training, and clinical practices. Here are some interesting research happening today. Surgical simulation researchers are applying cutting edge technology, which was originally used for training elite athletes to enhance the skills of surgical trainees, cutting the time of operations and saving patients' lives. Researching kidney reconditioning through gene therapy, extending the age limit of kidney patients and developing tests to predict early rejection. Reversing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease by deep brain stimulation working with stem cell scientists in China to develop artificial skin that sweats and grows hair, researching surgery for the elderly that improves post-operative recovery, developing an organ care system that keeps a heart beating and lungs breathing. This system is revolutionizing organ donation across the globe. So one of the main focuses of research in our lab is on HPV, that stands for the human papillomavirus. The HPV virus in the past two decades has been found to cause oropharyngeal cancers. Oropharyngeal cancers are basically cancers that are at the back of the tongue and tonsils. This has become basically a worldwide epidemic. The incidence has increased by over 300% in recent decades. So our research is, is uh, basically addressing part of this issue, this epidemic of HPV-related uh, head and neck cancer. The way an HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer is diagnosed currently is through a biopsy. And then that biopsy is processed by pathology. It can take one to two weeks to get a result from that. The resources are much more uh, involved in order to, to, to get a result and up to 10% of the time it's inaccurate. Our lab over the past five years has been able to develop a test that with a simple swab we're able to detect specifically the cancer causing strains of HPV and this is more sensitive and specific basically more accurate overall. That's pretty close to a hundred percent specific and that um, has a turnaround time, time of about 24 hours. We've done some initial clinical uh, validation studies. Now this is expanded towards sort of a larger clinical trial that's actually set to be Alberta-wide. So we have uh, funding from the Alberta Cancer Foundation for that, uh, which is a five-year project. We're into the second year of it now. Our lab's been working on something called uh, epigenetic chemotherapy. Epigenetics relates to changes that are not within uh, the DNA itself, but associated with the way the DNA um, is expressed. So these epigenetic changes are common in cancer. They're a hallmark of many cancers. 
and there are certain drugs that have been developed targeting these specific epigenetic pathways. We've chosen to look at oropharyngeal cancer specifically. Uh, we're interested in uh, basically testing these different drugs to see how effective they are at killing these cancer cells in the lab. Dr. Adetola Adesita and his team are currently in the process of developing artificial cartilage and knee meniscus to end the need for joint replacements. And what I essentially do is make functional body parts, um, mostly cartilage. So cartilage is very important in your body. Uh, without it, you can't hear what I'm saying. Without it, you can breathe. Without it, you can't run. So when cartilage gets damaged, it doesn't repair because it has very little blood supply. So you can just imagine that when you have an injury, it keeps on wearing out and wearing out. So this kind of technology can enable you to generate body parts that you can use to keep on going instead of putting things like metals or plastic inside your body that's gonna fail after a few years or so. And then you have to go back inside the patient and do another surgery and put in another plastic or metal that's not compatible really with the body. But now we can actually make the tissue from the patient's own cells, so the body's not gonna react towards it in a negative way. Over at the Cross Cancer Institute, a multidisciplinary team of oncologists, nurses, and physicians work together and share their passion to improve patient outcome. This team is carrying out clinical trials on innovative uses of what is becoming an anti-thyroid cancer drug, resulting from Dr. Todd McMullen's research. His team found that a specific protein could help identify whether thyroid cancer had the ability to spread to lymph nodes. So the decision to come back had multiple features. Uh, Sydney was again a, a great city and they had a, a very nice program. But for surgical oncology and for some of the work I did and combining research with uh, clinical work, this was a natural, you know, a natural choice for me here in Edmonton. The imaging modalities that are available here, um, again, are second to none. And the radiobiology program and the new radiation therapy program, of course, are fantastic. And this all feeds in to provide the infrastructure to do research when you're trying to make a new diagnostic for, for patients with thyroid cancer, for example. So the focus of my research when I came back was to look at why tumors, thyroid cancer in particular, spread to lymph nodes. Uh, when we target that particular protein, we can hopefully stop the tumors from growing and stopping them from spreading to lymph nodes. We identified an old drug, and in fact, I had, knew, I had known about this drug from uh, tumors of the stomach, and I, I knew that it targeted the same protein, and so for me, it was, it was a, at that moment, we knew that it would apply to, theoretically to just about every thyroid cancer, especially ones greater than a centimeter, and so the whole goal of this therapy, these new treatments, uh, is to uh, help restore the thyroid cancer cell back to its what we call native state. So I'm trying to put myself out of a job essentially. Welcome to Blink Labs or Bionic Limbs for Improved Natural Control. Here in this laboratory, Dr. Ming Chan and his team are exploring how to integrate regenerated nerves into bionic limbs. So um, in our team, the uh, focus is on the patients because uh, uh, we see a lot of uh, young people coming in with bad nerve injury. So the question really at top of our mind is what can we do to make their life better? And it, we know a lot about um, nerve injuries and how to repair nerves uh, for people who cannot move their arms. However, in cases where pa people had uh, amputation, the problem is that the nerves are working except they don't have the hand anymore because of amputation. So through the experience that uh, we establish with uh, people with nerve injury, we know ways of rewiring the nerves in someone with amputation uh, in the stump. Um, and by using those nerve signals, uh, we have worked with engineers to find ways that those nerves can be used to directly talk to the prosthetic hands and to move it um, without um, 
uh, a great deal of effort because that is a much more natural way for the brain. In another lab not too far from here, Dr. Christine Weber's team collaborates with Dr. Chan on another aspect of nerve regeneration. Um, when peripheral nerves are injured, they can regenerate to a certain extent, but they're, uh, it's far from perfect, and so we are looking for ways to promote nerve regeneration. One way that we've uh, come up with is to condition a nerve with electrical stimulation before we do the cut nerve and repair surgery. So we found in the basic science lab that if you condition this nerve with the electrical stimulation, the nerves regenerate up to five times as much. There's uh, three of us in the Department of Surgery that have come together with different uh, skill sets. Dr. Chan is a um, physical rehabilitation uh, clinician, so he sees the patients, he knows what their problems are. It was his idea to look at electrical stimulation as a conditioning paradigm. I'm a neuroscientist, so I have the, the skill set of the uh, and the background for the for the research, for the basic science research. And then with Jenna Lin, uh, she is a PhD student, our PhD student, and as well, she's a plastic surgeon resident. Dr. Sanger is a member of our graduate program that attracts global talent. We give graduate learners the opportunity to work in high impact research teams that make a difference. Here too, we lead in innovation. Our master's program with specialization in surgical education was the first of its kind in North America. Dr. Ming Chan and Dr. Christine Weber are just another example of researchers improving lives together. The University of Alberta is the birthplace of the Edmonton Protocol, a revolutionary procedure for conducting islet transplants for those with type 1 diabetes. What does that mean? Insulin-free patients. Dr. Norman Kniedemann was a member of the original research team that created the breakthrough. You know, it was after 15 years of initial experiments that we carried out our first series of clinical islet transplants in 1989. Um, Two of those patients were able to get off insulin, although for shorter periods of time, one just over a year. And so it was back to the lab and basically further development work. And then 10 years later, the uh, program came back into clinical activity, now under the leadership of James Shapiro, and was able to really accomplish some milestone works with seven consecutive patients free from insulin therapy. It's gone on basically to carry on to a program that now provides care to 30 or 40 people every year and over 700 islet transplants since the program started. It's important to realize that this is critical preliminary work, but the real big goal is to try to find a way to make this therapy available to the broad spectrum of people with diabetes. The University of Alberta is ranked sixth in the world for transplantation. This success is thanks to our surgeons and scientists. We have heart, lung, liver, kidney, pancreas, islet, small intestine, and the whole range of cell transplant therapies, which is becoming an important new part of clinical delivery as well. And it's not just the breadth of, of, of the programs, but the depth as well. The volume of numbers, uh, the, the care provided is, has, has really uh, uh, become quite important in terms of our, our delivery of care. Our center does over 350 clinical transplants every year and that leads to a total, in fact, of over 7,500 that have been done since the program started. Those numbers are, are, are important, and in fact, if we take just our liver transplant program, we have over 1,000 patients, basically, that are alive today with a, a functioning liver transplant. Along with transplantation, other life-saving surgeries occur on a daily basis. Remember Dr. Daniel Birch? Not only does he run the CASES program here at the U of A, he is also a bariatric surgeon. Edmonton is one of the premier centers in Canada by volume, research, and innovation. Uh, in Edmonton, we, uh, um, we have uh, a weight management program. Yeah, this program is focused on uh, the management of patients with severe obesity. So we have a number of uh, team members. We have a multidisciplinary team, and the patient can expect um, a lot of assistance and management in terms of lifestyle management, uh, sometimes pharmacologic management to help them with weight loss and surgical management. So bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery is really the only evidence-based approach to achieve significant and sustainable uh, weight loss. 
for most, most patients with uh, severe obesity. Our urologists pioneered robotic surgery in the city to the point where it's now considered routine. Our surgeons operate the Da Vinci robot, which is for minimally invasive gynecologic surgical procedures. Surgeons control robotic arms from a console. These arms have multi-jointed instruments, a 3D HD camera resulting in more precision and control. Thanks to the Da Vinci robot, certain surgeries are less invasive and recovery is quicker. In addition to accessing state-of-the-art technology, our surgeons experience treating a high volume of patients and high-complexity cases in two big, busy trauma centers. Dr. Sandy Witter is a senior trauma surgeon and intensivist. I think there's lots of opportunities in Edmonton. Part of it is our geographical location. We've got a huge catchment area that encompasses northern BC, northern Saskatchewan, obviously central and northern Alberta, and we also look after the territories. Um, we've got special vulnerable populations that we also look after. So it's an interesting mix of patients and definitely clinical caseloads. Yeah, I think one of the things people don't realize about trauma is it's not just about a particular surgical subspecialty. Trauma is actually a spectrum. It encompasses pre-hospital care, the actual resuscitation that happens in the eMERGE bays, um, operations where the surgeons are involved, uh, post-op care where clinicians and intensivists are involved, and then obviously the rehab and reintegration piece. We're essentially the quarterback that brings this whole team together, not only of different surgical subspecialties, but allied health, nurses, everybody down to the housekeeper who are so important in looking after our patients. Being a major referral center means the university has leading clinical facilities and equipment. Our neurosurgeons access cutting edge technology in what is becoming a $60 million brain center, including a gamma knife radio surgery unit and a 3T MRI integrated into the OR theater. It's the vision of Dr. Keith Aronic. We decided um, probably 15 years ago that we wanted to focus on image guided surgery of the brain and minimally invasive or even non-invasive. So we knew that if we were going to try and focus on minimally invasive or non-invasive, that we had to have a radio surgery program. It's a program where you can hit targets in the brain and the skull deep inside without opening the skull. And this is it, where you can use gamma rays, high energy photon beams, to focus down on a target. And not just one target, it can be one, two, 20 targets in the brain without having to open the skull. A, a person who has lung cancer that is spread to the brain. They have multiple spots in the brain. To remove those spots surgically would require a lot of surgery. To remove them with radio surgery is a day surgery procedure. So they can have their treatment without a haircut. They don't have to have the head shave. They don't have to have their skull open. They can have five, six, seven spots treated in the brain, both sides of the brain, top of the brain, bottom of the brain all these spots treated and still go home that evening for dinner and they could go to the airport the next day and several have. Several have literally gone to the airport the day after treatment and able to live their lives. The brand new Northern Alberta Vascular Center at Grey Nuns Community Hospital has state-of-the-art facilities. It offers two operating theaters with high-end technology that produces exceptional imaging. These were the first hybrid operating rooms in Canada with this advanced technology. The new suites improve clinical outcomes, patient comfort, and image quality at a reduced x-ray exposure to help patients get home faster. Innovation and the desire to improve lives led to the creation of the Alberta Thoracic Oncology Program, or ATOP, the first of its kind in Canada. ATOP has transformed existing lung cancer care services, 
slashing wait times by implementing a diagnostic imaging direct notification process in all major centres in Northern Alberta. So the Comprehensive Breast Care program was initially started as a group project between Covenant Health, Alberta Health Services and Capital Health because it was back in the times of Capital Health. And it was part of a provincial initiative to improve services in the province and improve wait times. There's a very large group of people who we got together, got input from the community to see what needed to be done and from there uh, mapped the system that a woman went through from the beginning uh, when she first had an abnormality either detected through a uh, screening mammogram, her family physician or herself and what it took for her to get from there to when she finally got to the cancer clinic and tried to shorten the timeline. Different aspects of the um, medical community worked independently and they came together uh, to make things work, especially radiology. They were marvelous in coming together and overcoming the differences between their different practices and making it work for the better uh, betterment of the patient. Because the care is so good here, we have had patients who come from out of province to try and obtain care here. Currently that's no longer allowed, but uh, back in the 2000s it wasn't uncommon to see out of province patients here. The division of general surgery has expanded the number of breast surgeons, in particular oncoplastic surgeons, to improve the outcome of women with breast cancer. Survival for breast cancer has improved so much over my career, very dramatically. So now women are surviving many, many years and many are cured from it. And so what the breast looks like after is very important. There is a, a thing called oncoplastic surgery and what it does is at the time that you are doing the breast cancer surgery, you were thinking about reshaping the breast, rebuilding the breast so that the woman has a cosmetically good outcome right from the get-go. So it's been almost two decades that the program has been around. The breast program as a whole in Alberta, and especially in Edmonton, is excellent. Um, and I'm not talking just about the surgical aspect, but I'm also talking about the cancer clinic here. The Cross Cancer Institute is outstanding. The care patients receive there is second to none, and there is a phenomenal amount of breast cancer research that comes out of the Cross Cancer Institute. The, the breast program has impacted thousands and thousands of lives because virtually all women who have breast cancer in the Edmonton region go through the program. The Institute for Reconstructive Sciences and Medicine, IRSM, is an internationally recognized clinic and research institute focused on medical reconstructive sciences. Dr. Hamid Khan is its executive director. The Institute is, is known worldwide for its use of digital planning. For instance, we have developed the Alberta Reconstruction Technique, which focuses on using digital planning to treat malignant cancers. Prior to digital planning, the surgeons used to use their discretion to determine where the, the right spot to cut is. Whereas through digital planning, we use CAT scan images, and this way, now the surgeons, after digital planning, they can pinpoint the precise areas where they need to cut. So that has dramatically improved patient outcomes. The culture is not so much to incorporate a shiny toy unless and until it has a direct line of sight towards improving patient outcomes. RSM has a long-standing history to measure and improve patient outcomes, and we use these data to continuously improve care that we provide, because ultimately, it's the optimal outcome that we're interested in achieving, it's the outcome that matters to the patient that we're interested in achieving. When a person has cancer in their head and neck, and the surgeon removes that cancer, individuals lose their dignity because you're essentially removing a part of their face. IRSM rebuilds them and rebuilds their dignity in that process. So we give the people their faces back, their identities back. That's what we do at IRSM. This innovative journey of research, teaching and clinical application has attracted a global crew of first-class talent. This includes surgeons, scientists, lab personnel, administrators, nurses, 
all working together, improving lives. Leading these values into the future is the Office of Global Surgery. The Office of Global Surgery is dedicated to bringing quality, ethical, and responsible access to surgical care and surgical services to those who need it. This might be in remote community in Canada or an indigenous group uh, that doesn't have access to those services, or it might be a group uh, or a community in an African setting. It's a team of dedicated individuals that come from multidisciplinary background that are looking to impact change in the global surgical sphere, both in our own backyards and overseas. What we are trying to do is to find a way of bringing the latest advancements that would even be novel in any high income setting, such as 3D printing. Can we, instead of making a mold, which is very expensive, 3D print the final product. One of the impacts of the Office of Global Surgery has been in bringing uh, Advanced Trauma Life Support, or ATLS. Uh, we've been able to, uh, in partnership with Kenyan partners, including the Ministry of Health in Kenya, the Kenya Red Cross Society, as well as the Surgical Society of Kenya, to develop an entire office of ATLS, or a branch of the American College of Surgeons locally, to be able to offer that very advanced education to impact the life of countless trauma patients. We've been able to generate sustainable revenue, a standard of care locally, and also train uh, multiple people every year in batches all across the country. The vision for where we want to take this is to have a, a vehicle to be as innovative in, in, um, in creating a, a new business models and new ways to create impact by merging the charitable, the academic, the for-profits and the not-for-profit sectors together to be able to deliver on new financial sustainability models and, and greater impact.